Biomedical engineers try to address all kinds of, I think, exciting questions at the interface of medicine and engineering. There are so much unknowns in biological system. Biomedical engineering brings these two big fields of medicine and engineering together. It's a very broad field. Imagine a neurologist 30 years ago without imaging. Their options were very limited. And that's a remarkable example of how engineering uh, can impact uh, medicine very dramatically. We can think, we can feel, we understand, we interact with others. But on the other hand, we know very little about how brain works. In the field of neuroengineering, we focus on non-invasive brain-computer interface. We put electro sensor on the scalp, and these sensor can pick up an extremely weak electrical signal generated by the neurons. We're able to pick up voltage differences in different areas of the scalp. So when a subject imagines using an arm or a leg, it actually activates the motor cortex in much the same way it would activate if they were actually doing that thing in real life. And then we decode the signal to try to find out what the subject is thinking or intend to do, and then use that signal to control a device. The promise of research like this is to allow for paralyzed individuals to interact and to communicate again with the outside world. We do research in the area of wireless sensors and robotics for rehabilitation. Unfortunately, about 50% of the people that you do any sort of rehab with uh, don't get better, and we really don't understand why. A major question that we're trying to address is whether through the interaction with a robot a person can actually learn motor tasks. That's essential in stroke survivors, in traumatic brain injury survivors. The Locomat is a robotic exoskeleton for robotic gait training. Can make you walk a little bit faster now. Okay. Manual gait training, as was usually done, was really a strenuous on therapists where they had to independently move the person's legs through the standard walking pattern. We've uh, formed a collaboration with the company that develops the Locomat, and so we're actually able to tap in uh, using our own software and change the way that the robot works. The Martian Analysis Laboratory was established to perform clinical evaluations, mostly in children with cerebral palsy. We have uh, eight infrared cameras that go around the room and they point in the central walkway. The cameras emit the light that gets reflected from the markers and the computer can pick up the movement of the markers. The green lines show the different bony segments, while the yellow line uh, represents the force that is exerted during gait. It's something that will help uh, the doctors uh, in seeing how the outcome of surgeries or intervention uh, lasts through the time. A lot of times when they come in, they want to impress the clinician, so they tend to walk better than what they would do when they're at home. The issue that we have developed as sensors that are embedded in the sole of the shoe itself. Once you know, they put the shoe on, it's like wearing a normal sneaker. You can have a monitoring that is uh, less obtrusive and uh, it's conducted in uh, their home environment, so we can actually collect more data and have a better insight on how the disease progresses. Wearable technology has become possible over the past 10 years because of major developments that allow us to integrate sensors into garments. We have the potential that if you can wear a, some form of a monitoring device that your vitals can be monitored on a more regular basis and we can send that information through a cloud environment before you need to go into an emergency department because you're very unwell. My father is actually an amputee and when I was young I promised him I'd make him an arm one day. An amputee can live their life pretty normally with a prosthetic, but the idea that you can just take it to that next level, that's important to me. One way to do it that, that we've developed is you could take a plastic scaffold, a polymer scaffold. That could be whatever shape you want, depending on the organ or tissue you're trying to make. Then you might put certain cells on it and give it the right nutrients and also the right mechanical forces. 
grow it to a certain point and then do a transplant that onto the patient or into the patient. If you think about how complex the uh, organ is, it's really difficult to mimic what happens in nature. One of the big challenges is the vascularization. Also in terms of stem cells, there are a long way to go. We have to understand what makes them differentiate. How can we control them so that they will not develop cancer? We're working on making various tissues and organs in the body. I mean, new spinal cords, vocal cords, new intestine, heart tissue. So there's a whole range of things that we've been, been working on. How are the micro bubbles doing? Uh, Today in the area of drug delivery, so some of the things we're most excited about are nanotechnology where one might be able to uh, deliver drugs right to a uh, tumor or no other place in the body. Microbubbles, they are very uh, tiny particles, micron size, and instead of being filled with liquid, they're filled with gas. And because of that, they're visible on ultrasound, and they're used to improve ultrasound diagnostics. So I'm focusing on trying to uh, incorporate drugs into these microbubbles. If I have those microbubbles loaded with drugs, I can inject them onto the body, they will distribute everywhere, but then I can disrupt the microbubbles by an ultrasound beam, and the drug will be delivered specifically where the drug is needed. And so this is the uh, exciting engineering design that I am working on. It's not just research that stays on the bench. It's research that goes to the market, goes to help people. try to dream up things that we feel can really have a big impact, like a, maybe a super band-aid. We set it up to look very much like a gecko, because the gecko has enormous adhesivity on their feet, so to speak, and the band-aid has all these nano protrusions from it. So there's enormous surface area, and so now we're looking at it for making certain forms of surgery easier, like intestinal surgery, various different types of medical adhesive applications. A lot of times what we do is we license things to companies or we, a lot of times we've started companies that create products. There is other cases in which uh, companies are actually coming in and they're asking us to either assess their technology or uh, redesign their technology. So we get to see cutting edge technologies, the prototype devices. Major focus of our research is the electrical properties of both skeletal and cardiac muscle. One of the things that we're doing is really novel is we're actually reanimating uh, human hearts. And these are hearts that have been uh, deemed non-viable for transplantation. That were gifts from the organ donors and their families to the lab. And if they have good enough function, we'll reanimate them and we'll be able to look at the internal anatomy while the isolated heart is functioning. And just like a heart transplant, you have four to six hours before you need to reanimate that heart. We'll get it to beat on its own in a native rhythm, and then um, we can put cameras inside and visualize any of the functional anatomy, really study this device tissue interface of new pacing systems or leads. We actually have a whole free access website that anybody can go online and see the functional anatomy from these human hearts. Biomedical engineering is not just a field for engineers, but also there's a bio side. The physicians who are working in the cl clinics every day um, are going to see what the problems are. And the engineers may have already solved those problems and not even know they're there. Patients get whatever the engineers make. Engineers make whatever they think the patients need. The way I look at it is the physicians are able to ask great questions, and, then, and the en engineers are able to come up with great answers. But if you just have one and not the other, you don't solve them because you don't even know what to ask or don't know how to answer them. So we like to establish things as an iterative loop. It's a loop where people are going back from the laboratory to the clinic and then back to the lab again, refining our questions. So it really helps to keep everybody's research very uh, relevant. I initially joined the Engineering and Medicine Biology Society to be able to connect with other like-minded people. That's where I feel that I learned what exciting science is going on in the field. You can kind of get this teleportation right to the cutting edge of a field 
and be part of that discussion. For physicians, being a part of the MBS uh, provides an opportunity to be exposed to new technologies to provide feedback about the way we are developing this technology within the engineering society. And I think it's this partnering with all these different disciplines from these different careers that um, really is essential to move the field forward. I feel I belong to part of important profession network, which is making a big impact to the society. It's only um, exciting if research actually makes it off the bench top and helps people.